Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Zoe. I am a PhD candidate in the Department of Political Science. I'm going into my fifth year. Um, I study public opinion and political behavior. And I'm also um, vice president of Students of Color of Rackham, um, which is a really great group I hope you get involved with while you're here. And yeah, looking forward to this panel. Hi everyone, my name is Vivian Nguyen. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a second year master's student studying higher education with a concentration in public policy. Hi everyone, welcome to Michigan. Um, so my name is Juliana Loretta Wiggins. I'm in the Department of American Culture. I'm starting my fifth year in the PhD program. I'm also a certificate student in the Center for World Performance Studies and the program for Latina, Latino, and Latinx studies. Thank you, panelists. Thank you. OK, so my first question for y'all is, what do you wish you knew in your first year here? Uh, yeah, so I'll go first. Um... One of the biggest things that uh, I wish I had known my first year um, was how to access mental health resources on campus. Um, you know, mental health issues are um, really disproportionately high for grad students in general, but especially for students of color, women of color. Um, and while we do learn a little bit about CAPS, I think in our like orientation to the university, we don't learn about how to go beyond CAPS. And so if you need like sustained treatment and care, um, there's not a whole lot of discussion of what options are available to you, particularly if you're like a PhD student and you have the graduate student insurance. Um, what are your options? How much are you going to have to pay for a copay, et cetera? Um, so yeah, that's one of the biggest things I wish I had known, how to deal with that, how to pay for mental health care, um, and then also how to navigate um, relationships with your advisors. Uh, so. You know, I came from a background where asking for help, particularly from people who have power over you, was not really encouraged. Um, you know, I was taught to sort of figure things out on my own. And in grad school, it's just really not feasible to do that. Um, and you often end up wasting time or wasting your resources when you don't rely on, on people you can trust for help. And it can be tricky to figure out who, who you can trust, like who's a safe person. Um, but it's so important to find a safe person and literally ask them um, for everything, even the smallest questions, because there's norms and etiquette and rules that you don't, um, that, you know, sort of hidden curriculum that you don't learn about um, unless you have an, a relationship with an advisor. So, yeah. Yeah, so um, while score is really great, for sure, I've loved their events in the past. Um, for the first few months of my time at Michigan, I didn't know that there were also other groups or other ways that I could connect with other students of color on campus. Um, and for me, as a Southeast Asian woman of color and a daughter of refugees, I've found that WAKADA, which stands for a woman of color at the academy, the APIA grads listserv um, and SAFE, which is Students Allied for Freedom and Equality, or just a few of the spaces that I've been able to connect with other students and meet other students of color, specifically from backgrounds similar to my own. Um, and also something I'll say is it might be a little bit awkward at first, but there are a lot of clubs on campus that on the surface might seem only open to undergraduates or only open to students from that specific school. But I'd say just go to their event or like reach out to them because most of the time these are open to other students and it can be a really nice way to also make some like interdisciplinary friendships or connections. Yeah, what I wish I knew, like just what Vivian and Zoe said, I went to SCORE events when I first moved to, to Michigan, and I thought that those were just communities that I was like, oh, great, like, even though I, I came from a Hispanic serving institution, coming to a predominantly white institution, I would think I noticed more of like a lack rather than like actually an abundance of like amazing people, um, and so SCORE is like an amazing resource, but 
I wish I knew my first year was just about navigating these resources, just like what my fellow panelists said is like, take the time to go to events. Um, you don't have to read everything. <laughs> I wish I had known just like, you don't have to read three books a week. If that's your um, jam, go for it. Um, I wish I had known that really the first year is just making friends or making connections. Um, make friends with your neighbors in your apartment building. Just, you know, talk to folks who um, might not also be involved in the community or the University of Michigan community, because I think it you can lose yourself having to think you have to do everything for your classes. Like, you know, it's, it's just an easier way also to acknowledge that like you might struggle at times too. So yeah, use the first year to navigate all of these resources in the community in and out of Michigan. Thank you, y'all. Thank you. I would also add, um, for me, what I wish I'd known in my first year as a Black student is that um, just because a professor is Black does not mean that we will vibe, does not mean that they will be supportive, does not mean that they will, um, see, that our research interests or ideas about how to critically approach research will align and um that was honestly a, a, a more a, a devastating blow for me uh that and I, I realize now that I had expectations that were unrealistic and so I definitely wish I had known that like just because um, a professor, especially be coming from a predominantly white institution and then coming here, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's multiple professors who are black in my in my department. Like, we're gonna be such good friends. <laughs> no, that's, that's not necessarily the case. And so to um, find your people intellectually, spiritually, um, and to look for that, because this journey in grad school is quite long. Um, and like Juliana said, um, classes don't really matter as much as like the community will get you through community will get you through like these are long years y'all <laughs> and um I would definitely I wish I had focused more on that my first year okay y'all so now that we've talked about what you wish you had knew known your first year what do you wish you had done in your first year yeah kind of building on Sam's point about community um so I started grad school like right before COVID hit, like late 2019. Um, so even though I didn't have many opportunities to like connect with people in person, um, once the pandemic really picked up and everything was shut down, I wish I had taken that first semester to really like do every activity possible. Um, and instead I spent a lot of time obsessing over problem sets and trying to read three books a week to Juliana's point, um, things that didn't really end up serving me in the long run the way that building community would have. Um, so obviously, hopefully, you know, um, all the first years here won't have to worry about a global pandemic um, in the next couple of years. But regardless, I think you should spend as much time as you can um, finding your people in the first few months of school. Uh, that's the best time to do it. And those connections are going to carry you through your entire PhD process or masters. Yeah, I'll speak a little bit to like the master's experience since it is a little bit short term and this kind of depends on your program, but I really wish that I was a little bit more strategic with my courses and my electives in a way that was really maximizing um, the time I got to spend on my interests or like speaking to my own identities. Um, I feel like last year I was kind of on autopilot, kind of just doing whatever my program was encouraging us to do. And it was kind of keeping myself from overcoming that imposter, imposter syndrome that I was feeling that was stopping me from challenging myself more. But um, like last semester, I got to take a law course. It was such a culture shock, um, but I honestly really found it so rewarding to just learn about how other people think about the same subjects as I am from a different perspective. Um, so I really think like if you have the opportunity, maybe try to take a class outside of um, what you've already felt comfortable in or just something that really interests you. And you can also audit if you want something that's kind of like a lower commitment to. Autopilot is a really good way to do it. So 
two things that I wish I had done my first year. <laughs> first is that I wish I had kept up the hobbies and um, kind of kept the networks that I, I had cultivated in New Mexico. I, I moved here from New Mexico. Um, and I just wish that I had like maintained my active lifestyle. I feel like I really gave that up my first year because I was like nose in the books the whole time. Um, and so I just wish I had really kept my networks intact and also possibly like joined a network here, right? Um, in terms of like being just active. And second, I wish I had done less compromising of my identity to please faculty. I did a lot of that my first year and sort of like what Vivian was saying, where it's like you, um, you know, you're you're on a certain track and you are meant to write a certain way, read a certain way. And that really doesn't suit me. It doesn't suit my needs. It doesn't like fill my cup to write in this sort of prose that is not like what my heart speaks. It's not like my language, you know? Um, so I just wish I had really just leaned into more about who I am and use this time as an exploratory process into my own scholarly identity, because what I do is completely based on my identity itself, my personal identity. So I just wish I had done less compromising with faculty and told them what I think they would like to hear versus like what I actually thought. Thanks y'all, thank you. Um... All of that definitely resonates. And for me, so mine is much more practical of what I wish I'd done my first year. I wish I went to Detroit more. I wish I had gone to the city. I That is one of the most famous Black cities in the country, in the world. Um, and there's a bus that takes you there. I wish I had part, like, just like grouped up with folks and gotten more zip cars or rented cars and just like went out to Detroit and didn't rely on the bus to try to get back and just like maybe stayed and gotten an Airbnb. I don't know, but you know, it's just, it's right there. Um, and it's so rich. Um, and I wish I had, again, maybe not focused so much on class classes and like gone, just gone to the city more. Or in like Chicago's also right there. You can take a bus for like five hours and you'll get there. And it's just definitely, I would say, take advantage of this proximity to some of the some of these like incredible cities. Um, okay, y'all. So what were the best things that helped you when you first got here? Yeah, um, so I think having um, spaces specifically for students of color um, was the greatest help to me. So there's SCORE, of course, which is a larger organization, but within my department, we also had um, a group specifically for students of color. Um, and that not only helped me establish like a sense of community, but it introduced me to older students um, who could guide me and like help me figure out, you know, my footing in the first couple of years. And some of the things that, some of the most important things I've learned as a grad student have come from getting advice from like older students who I could relate to. Um, so yeah, I, I would say like, find not just faculty mentors, but also student mentors, you know, sort of peer mentors um, who can help you, you know, not just with the social aspects, but with the, uh, the academic aspects too, because oftentimes they have more like front end knowledge of the questions that you have than professors who've been detached from what it means to be a grad student for like 10, 15 years, sometimes longer than that, oftentimes longer than that. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, three main things that helped me when I first got to Michigan. Um, well, the first would be like utilizing the Holistic Wellness Center on campus. Um, tried caps, just, it just didn't vibe well with me. Um, and I just couldn't figure out, to be honest, like what um, Zoe was saying earlier, trying to figure out insurance stuff was really hard with their um, like therapy or counseling. So I use them and they're really great. I think that the approach they take is just really user friendly or like beginner friendly. And it just worked well with my schedule since I had a pretty busy schedule. 
Um, also just like meeting students and getting added to whatever listservs or group chats that they're in can be really nice, um, especially if you don't think you'll have a lot of time to go to events or um, to just like work that into your schedule. It can be nice to just have like a virtual space to ask questions to a lot of like more advanced students who just have like that blueprint of where all the resources at Michigan are just like opportunities. Um, or just like joking about different things. It's just really nice to have. Um, and then the last thing is I got a bike, Ann Arbor super bike friendly, um, a lot of really nice trails and roads. And it's just really nice sometimes to get distance from the school. So if you're into that kind of thing, I would definitely recommend that. Um, when we got this question, it's like, Three things came to mind. First was I invested in a warm winter coat. <laughs> I like I I am deathly afraid of snow. I it, it's insane here. Um, so I'm like all blushing because I like it's it's dumb, but like get a warm winter coat if you're not used to it. Um, that was like the best thing ever. Also, the maize and blue. Um, oh, LL Bean winter coat, totally worth the investment. It's actually relatively affordable too. Um, and yes, get the boots. So anyways, um, <laughs> the maize and blue cupboard also, it's like this food pantry on campus. Best thing ever. You, I wasn't really like financially like in need. Like I just really sought it out because it's convenient. I was on campus almost every day anyways. And um, they have anything from like feminine hygiene products to toilet paper, to milk, eggs, flour, bread all of the basics you need and you can get it for free um and they also have little thank you notes that you can send to folks who donate it as well so maize and blue cupboard is super convenient and on campus and i still use it right now um since i'm still living locally and the best thing was that i joined the latinx riw it's called like the rackham interdisciplinary workshops i don't know if you zoe or vivian are in an riw um, but Latinx graduate students have our own. I began as a member, so I went to a meeting my first my first year, fell in love with the folks who I got to meet because it was the most Latinx grad students I had ever seen in a room at Michigan. So it was really incredible to meet folks from other departments. And now I'm also the director or like co-coordinator of the Latinx RAW. Um, and that's been really worthwhile to meet incoming Latinx students. And also, I went to a lot of undergraduate events <laughs> my first year here um, that were directed toward Latinx undergrads. So La Casa is an amazing organization. They welcome anyone. And I went because it was an event for Latinx students. And I got to hang out with undergrads who also eventually became my students. So it was just a really beautiful way to build community with folks in, in different ways too, but by going to events mostly. Thank you, y'all, thank you. Um, for me, the best things that I've done um, are, are align, along the lines with uh, Zoe is like connecting with older students is was so vital. Um, they are here to support you honestly go up or send them an email find out who they are um ask for ask for coffee they will sit down they'll talk with you they'll tell you the ins and the outs of the department um the who's who the what's what um and how they got to where they are and so i would definitely recommend um doing that and also what one of the best things that helped me was building community outside of not just my department, but also outside of Mich the University of Michigan um, and with folks in Detroit, with folks, locals in Ann Arbor and um, Ypsilanti, folks who aren't, so that you can not just be surrounded by <laughs> grad students all the time. It's really nice to um, sometimes be able to just be a person with folks. And so um, that is definitely one of the best things that I did uh, that helped me when I got here. Okay, y'all, so now we're going to transition into the Q&A portion of our session. And, um, but before we do, my colleague is going to place our evaluation survey in the chat. Can you please do me a favor and just open the link now so that you'll have the tab ready and waiting for you when we're done. This helps us improve our programming for you. <clears throat> and remember that we'll move to the Q&A by keeping stack. Um, 
which for those of y'all who have missed it is just going down the line of those who have flagged that they have a question in order of appearance. And you can get on the stack in three ways by using the raise your hand function and I will call on you by simply writing stack in the chat and I will call on you or writing your question in the chat and <clears throat> I will ask it for you. Please speak slowly so that the closed captioning can capture everything that you have to say. And also, I want to remind us that we may not get to every question, um, but we'll provide the panelists' email addresses at the end of the Q&A so that you can reach out to them personally with any unanswered questions. And also, I want to mention, for those of you who weren't here at the beginning, please change your name to the name that you registered with so that we can know that you're here. Okay, um, Destiny, would you like to ask your question? Can you hear me? Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, because nobody was saying anything, so I thought I was talking to myself. Um, I don't know if either, uh, is it Zoe? Or Zoe? Yes, Zoe, yep. Zoe, um, I'm uh, currently coming from an HBCU um, yeah. to University of Michigan. So um, I don't know if you all like know of someone or either uh, Sam or Zoe, um, how did you kind of adapt to the environment? Um, and was it somewhat hard? Because right now I'm here like during the summer right now, um, you know, transition into uh, fall and um, it seems so far so good, but is there things that I might need to like watch out of? Like, you know, maybe somebody, seeming nicer than they should and it's like I feel comfortable and then it kind of just you know flops on me type of thing yeah that's that's a great question Destiny um first thing I'll say is um if you haven't already connected with the HBCU alumni group um just started they're really great they do a bunch of events score we do stuff with them too um that's a great resource and I can like send you stuff about that if you haven't already found it um, I would say that, um, so I, I didn't come from an HBCU undergrad. I went to a predominantly white undergrad as well. Um, so I've been dealing with this, for, you know, like <laughs> nine years or something like that now. Um, and I would say, you know, uh, you will encounter, um, folks who talk down to you, who think that because you're black or because you're from the South or because you're from an HBCU that you don't know what you're talking about. Um, and I think one of the biggest things you can do to like uh, protect your own sanity is just like not to doubt yourself when you experience those microaggressions, like just acknowledge, okay. yeah, this happened to me and this was racist. Like you don't have to, you know, debate with yourself like, was this? No, if you felt uncomfortable, it was probably a bad interaction. It was a racist interaction. Um, and you can proceed from there to, you know, set boundaries around that person um, that you feel comfortable with. Uh, you don't have to, you know, feel obligated to talk to folks who are disrespectful to you or to, you know, be polite to them. Um, you know, the, whatever you're comfortable with, you should set that boundary and um, don't surround yourself with people who uh, don't respect you um, and all your accomplishments. And the second thing I would just say is you deserve to be here. Um, so also don't let those people get into your head because they're wrong. <laughs> like if somebody thinks that they're better than yeah. you for some reason or that you're not smart enough to engage in a conversation, they're wrong. Um, and they're probably just really insecure in themselves and they're projecting it onto you. So unfortunately it will happen, but like you, you have the power to set boundaries around people who make you feel uncomfortable. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zoe. And along those lines, honestly, I think the best way to navigate this for all of us is community. You need to find your community. And um, and I would say that should be your focus first year, <laughs> not classes, <laughs> not anything else. Like make sure that you find your people because they will have similar experiences. And the way you get through this is uh, through emotional support. Um, and so uh, yes, y'all classes like matter, sort of, but um, it is, it is, <laughs> everybody's sort of grimacing, 
Um, but I would say it's the um, it's the emotional, um, spiritual connections that you make that will get you through these tough times, whether it be academic or social or anything you encounter. Okay, so someone asks, how do you deal with uh, students who give off a demeanor that they know more than you just because you're a person of color? This person struggled with this topic a lot in undergrad and deals with students who assumed to know more than me because of the color of their skin. I can take this on. I think we're like sitting with that because it's, it's probably maybe happened, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, I feel like it's compounded, uh, especially like identifying as a woman, a woman of color in these spaces where, I mean, even just like the style of the classrooms are like not conducive to building community, getting to know one another. And so you, I, I did feel in this, I know, how do I answer this? It's really just like, how do you deal with it? Like what Zoe said, like, you got to move on. That's not your person. <laughs> like That's just like not someone who might be in your circle. Um, but I've also learned a lot how to communicate my feelings by like kind of reflecting on how I felt and understanding that this is a completely different region to me. This is not how um, maybe people find interactions. You know, also, I, I just had a complete culture shock when I came here. I'm not really answering the question. I just, it, that question brings up a lot for me, um, especially with folks who I interact with who might've come from like an Ivy League or like a top tier institution. And so it's a lot of this kind of ranking that happens. And so with that, you just kind of have to move on. Like, and I don't know, I found a therapist to be able to talk things through with that was really helpful. Um, and just know that people like that are going to exist. They exist not just in students, but they're in faculty too. Um, so yeah, I didn't really answer the question. I think it brought up a lot of emotions for me. <laughs> so thank you for that question. Uh, I was actually the one that asked the question. So I could give a hi, hello. <laughs> I'm staring at two monitors, so I might look weird. But um, just to kind of expand on it a little bit more, it was mostly classmates that would do that because there were only two of us in the class and the rest and that's in like most that was in most of my classes so they, that's kind of how they made me feel a lot to where I felt like I had to work a little harder and it kind of made me question myself when deep down I know that I don't have to question myself but that's just how they made me feel and sometimes these were classmates that I had to work with too so like how do I combat that to where I have to work with them on group projects but I I have to kind of find common ground and I don't want to come off as you know an angry black woman because I'm addressing a situation I can't fully answer your question but I'll try my best um last semester I was in a class and the whole class was like structured around group projects and I was like the only woman of color in my group, I felt really uncomfortable because we did have a lot of interpersonal issues. And it, I was, I felt really stressed like all the time. I felt really uncomfortable even bringing it up to my professor who was a white man. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I took that step and I did talk it through with him, um, which does take trust and not everybody is deserving of that, but um, it did make me feel better. and. I, I did feel supported. Um, and I did talk to another person in that class who addressed it way earlier before we had our group set and he switched them out of the group. Um, so that he, they, they didn't have to deal with that person. So I think that, um, you know, in some cases there are opportunities where it is uncomfortable to vocalize what you need, but it might be for the best. And then also just like, there are some moments where what I love about grad school is you don't have to see everybody all the time and you don't have to pretend to be friends with people. So I just don't talk to people who are not deserving of my time. Um, and it feels really great not having to like deal with like microaggressions all the time. So also would try that if, you know, that's open for you. Um, yeah, I, 
agree with everything Vivian said. And I would also just like um, add on that, you know, when it comes to like stereotypes, angry black woman stereotype, whatever stereotype like your, you know, identity faces, people are going to assume that about you no matter what you do. You can be the nicest, sweetest, kindest person ever, and they're still going to label you, you know, with the stereotypes that they bring to the table. So I would say don't let that fear of becoming a stereotype influence your actions or push you to like hold back who you are because you can be perfect and they're still going to put stereotypes on you. Thanks, y'all. Nia, you had a question? Can you hear me? Okay, perfect, because the Wi-Fi is kind of spotty. Um, but hello, um, I'm an incoming um, PhD student in the higher ed um, department. And um, thankfully, the program that I'm in itself is really diverse. The faculty might not be as diverse. Um, but I wanted to know um, specifically, like, um, the University of Michigan, it seems to kind of group all students of color together, not really giving um, each specific affinity group or identity group um, their own space to have their own thing. So how do you all um, navigate with not just being a student of color or a woman of color, but being a black woman, being an Asian woman, being a Latinx or Hispanic woman, um, and finding those spaces um, with your specific um, racial identity. And um, my second question is, do you find that your departments um, allow you to be involved? Um, do they allow you to be involved in like faculty searches or like, um, when they're hiring new faculty, do they allow students to um, sit on panels or like ask questions during panels when they're doing interviews and stuff like that? Because I know my department, they're seeking faculty um, in the next couple of years. And I'm wondering if like, do they take student input or do you feel like I'm just a student? I really don't have much power in that. I can take a stab at this one. Um, so yeah, I think to your, first of all, congratulations. I like higher ed students a lot, so. <laughs> um, but uh, so yeah, I think like to your point or to your observation that Michigan lumps POC together. I also see from my experience as a Latina, um, since we are such a very small community, at Michigan, speaking about the Latinx community, I see like a lot of kind of black versus white at Michigan. And I also see it as kind of like, well, here's a an award if you do anti-racist work. And that usually is like people of color who take on this sort of research, right? And I think that's Michigan trying to alleviate these sorts of issues. Like, oh, like we're predominantly white, but we also have opportunities for people of color too. So I do feel like sometimes the labor falls on us to have to build up our communities from the ground up. Um, and that's been a lot of my experience here. But I think what I have been able, I think to make a difference in American culture because America, my department houses all of ethnic studies across the university. So we have um, Apia studies, we have Latinx studies, um, we have Native American studies, and I actually am able to sit on these executive com uh, committee meetings in my department to help hire or help in these hiring searches. But also, um, as a Latinx certificate student, I go to a lot of job talks across the university in the humanities, and I am able to give input about candidates for hire within um, the Latinx certificate program or Latinx faculty who might do work not even on Latinx communities, right? Because you don't always do work on your own affinity group too. So yeah, I've, I've found that I have a little bit of, I wouldn't even say sway, but I'm definitely able to give input as a Latinx student on kind of like vibes that I get from incoming faculty. And that's just from getting involved on my committees. Um, and usually your department will send an email out 
I don't know how other departments work, but mine sends an email out if you're interested in joining these committees. Does anyone else have anything to add to Nia's question? Yeah, I would also say um, finding folks is is a an endeavor that um, I one has to put effort into finding black people specifically um, because and it's also easy to stick with the folks in your department or the folks in your cohort because like you spend a lot of time with those folks and like to go out but those that's not that might not be people who are um racially similar to you and to go out and to look for events to flag down people on the street and say hey like you seem cool do you want to hang out <laughs> um it's um there's what i community community building will take work um, but I, and it's not necessarily work that the, the university tries to foster in particular ways, like you said, students of color, but um, for particular, for your specific racial group, it will take um, intentional, intentionality is what I will say, and uh, effort. And I think that effort is well spent. And uh, yeah, some, my department now has um, students on committee for new hires, but that's only recently because we had issues and the students brought up those issues and so they made changes. <laughs> and so now we actually get a, a voice in, in um, who's being brought in. Um, but I don't know if that's the same across the board. Um, okay, panelists, do you feel, did you feel, or do you feel imposter syndrome as a POC slash WOC? And how do you work through that? So yes, <laughs> all the time, every day. <laughs> um, I think, uh, I can't remember if Juliana or you made this point earlier. I think therapy is one of the best um, ways you can help to alleviate or deal with the symptoms of uh, imposter syndrome um, or whatever, you know, sort of mental health care practices, um, you know, speak to you and fit your lifestyle but you, you have to make time um, to take care of yourself and like understand where those feelings are coming from. Um, I, I watched a commencement address the other day and the speaker was talking about how we treat imposter syndrome like it's this individual problem that individuals need to solve. Um, you know, and we pathologize it like, oh, well, these people just have imposter syndrome and they just need like to cure it somehow and then everything will be fine. But Imposter syndrome is a systemic issue. These systems and institutions have excluded certain groups of people um, for a long time and still are. And, you know, I think we have to take the weight off of ourselves, like, you know, from like completely eliminating imposter syndrome or getting rid of it. You're never going to get rid of it um, until these institutions are completely rebuilt. Um, the best we can do in the meantime is just to cope and take care of ourselves. Um, so yeah, I guess my response to that would just be that you'll never completely get rid of imposter syndrome because it's baked into our institutions, um, but you can find ways to, to cope with it in the meantime. Um, I also see that there's a question underneath that that's talking about like sessions to help. Um, if I remember correctly, Rackham does have some sessions, at least last year they did, talking about imposter syndrome. And it was, it was kind of helpful to go to that and just hear that there are other people who also feel the same exact way that I am. Um, and I think just some general advice that my advisor gave to me is just like treat class like practice, not a performance. You don't need to be perfect. And like, it was super intimidating to be in a class and everybody has like things in paragraphs and everything like citing like off offhand. Um, so you don't have to be that way. Great if you you are, but it's okay if you're not 
you know, wherever you're at. Um, and like, there's no right way to perform student or to be a student. So just, just do you, um, that's what I'd say. I would like to add y'all that imposter syndrome is unfortunately natural for graduate students. I, th I don't think there's a graduate student, regardless of how they might seem on the outside, who hasn't experienced this. And like Zoe said, it is just an unfortunate consequence of the way of the institution and of being a graduate student. Um, but it's natural and it is something that uh, you can and will overcome as with more practice and time and care. Naomi, do you still have a question? Do you have another one? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, okay, so I went to a PWI and I never found my people through all four and a half years. I don't want to repeat the same mistakes. So what are some key points that I could do to, you know, find people that have the same interests and even if there's different interests you know I could learn from someone as they could learn from me but also I would like to input that I am commuting from Detroit so you know sidebar if someone wants to come on down to the city I will show you around but yeah oh that's the end of my question oh I think that's a really great question. I think it goes back to what um, I wish I had done, but like you're coming from Detroit and I think this can, this applies to everyone here, but like you're going to be surrounded by a whole other community that is at this point kind of separated from Michigan. Like Michigan tries, like has its fingers kind of in every community in a different way, but Detroit is such a cool, cool place. Like there's something going on. And so I think like, you know, build connections outside of Michigan. Those will be also who your people are. They don't have to be affiliated with the university. It's sometimes nice to connect with people who, um, sometimes I call them like real people. <laughs> like, you know, folks who like work a nine to five, right? We have a lot of flexibility and that's totally a blessing. But I think it's also important, like go into your own community and see what, what can you teach? Like, or what can you do in Detroit? How can you be a, a steward of your own work and of your own values um, in Detroit, for example? So I think that this is like a really cool opportunity for you to like kind of immerse yourself, get like down with the city because it's super cool. Also visit Southwest Detroit too. That's predominantly Latinx. Yeah, I totally agree with Juliana. Um, and I would also add, you know, as a Black student um, who also went to a PWI for undergrad um, with similar like percentages as Michigan, it, it can be really hard when we restrict ourselves to like one university to find our people. So I would encourage you to like build connections with other grad students, especially Black grad students at other schools. Some of like my closest like grad student friends are not even in the state of Michigan, but they're in PhD programs across the country. And we meet up at conferences and like we see each other, you know, throughout the year and we, we text all the time. And that type of stuff also helps keep me grounded um, and feeling like I have a sense of community um, that goes beyond the Michigan sort of bubble. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add, but something I didn't know is like there are a lot of people on Instagram and a lot of people on Twitter, like academic Twitter, academic Instagram that you can make really great connections with, um, like find really cool events and just meet really awesome people. So I would recommend that. Thank Thanks, you. Um, someone asked a place to find student orgs online. I know Zoe answered it in the chat. Is there anyone else who wanted to delve a little deeper? Sorry, Sam, what was the question? A place to find student orgs, organizations. Is there some place that you would recommend beyond May's pages?
That's okay if it's not. Maze, oh, Maze is a good start. I can't remember the name of it, but like maybe it's called like Maze Sessions where you can just see like every single day what events are happening. To be honest, I use that to find like free food on campus, but sometimes you can also find like really interesting events or affinity group events too. I follow um, organizations on campus. So La Casa, for example, um, and I just, they update their calendars with events, but on Instagram, they're always like posting what's up, what's new. Um, so I use mostly social media to find out events and also flyers on campus. I'm like all old school. I'll like find a flyer and like go to the event. I don't know if anyone does that anymore. Um, but yeah, I think that they're still super effective. <laughs> yeah, especially if you're on central campus, the um, Haven slash Angel Hall, there's always tons of posters for everything going on in there. Thanks, y'all. We have time for a couple of more. Do you have any tips for being told that someone's accent is too hard to understand? And are there any affinity groups for women or people um, from Southeast Asia? I know that in the international um, session panels last week, um, some a representative from Grin Graduate Rackham International, the student organization said that he made a point to say that someone he had a worry about his accent when he started T um, GSI and TA. I forget which one it's called here, <laughs> um, but started teaching courses. And the person who was working with him told him, "Don't ever lose your accent. Like people will understand you. Um, it is, it is who you are." And don't ever try to shrink or hide who you are to fit into this space. Just like Juliana was saying earlier. Yeah, not much to add again, but um, there aren't any groups specific to Southeast Asian students, which can be hard sometimes when like the larger Asian groups on campus are dominated by East Asians. Um, but I would still recommend maybe trying to join them. Um, Grin is great. International House is also, I don't know if it's affiliated with campus, but also a great place to meet people. Um, and also APIA grads is also really nice in trying to find people. Destiny, you have uh, your hand raised. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> um, so my question is um because I don't know if anybody um on here is from like other than I know Juliana's from like New Mexico, but I'm from North Carolina. So I am from the South, um, coming up here to the Midwest. So we kind of say, okay, there you have the the um uh, categorization of racism, but then also mannerism. I still have not figured out which is which, because at this point, like, there's things that I do, and I'm like, this is my type of mannerism, but am I taking this as, like, a slight to me or to how I was raised? So it's kind of a thing of how do you kind of differentiate or, uh, or, I don't know, like categorize which is which, because that's the one thing I'm like a little confused because I've had uh, at one point, because um, I'm in the med school right now, I was in the like the hospital part getting some food and literally blatantly, this person like literally did not say excuse me and just walk straight. And I'm just like, I mean, I know you saw me, but I don't know like when to say, okay, was should I have addressed that or should it just kind of just let it go by the wayside type of thing? That's the only part like I'm a little confused about still being here. I don't totally know how to answer this. This is a good question. Um, I've been in the Midwest my whole life, and but I have a lot of family in the South. So I would say, like in general, people in the Midwest are not as nice 
um, <laughs> it's like a little more rude. Uh, so that's just something to like keep in mind culturally. Um, yeah, but I think like if somebody does something that's offensive and like rude, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with sticking up for yourself and saying something like in that in the situation you just described it seems like it was pretty obvious that they were being rude so um definitely I, de I would definitely say don't back down if you feel like uncertain like you should speak up I would add to that trust your trust your gut to everyone here there will be instances in Ann Arbor where you <laughs> you don't know um because there are a lot of like there's a certain way about folks that makes it seem like you're the one who's who's off but trust your gut your gut will will always guide you um and help you understand what what is happening even if everyone else around you is saying something different okay y'all um, thank you. This has been wonderful. And I know you have more questions and I, we will make sure to add your um, the panelists email addresses so that you can reach out to them. Before we go, I'd like to ask the panelists one final question. What is the biggest piece of advice that you would like to leave our audience members with today as they begin their new journey here at Michigan? Okay, I have two. Um, one is take up space. Um, you deserve to be here. You deserve to have all of the resources that Michigan offers its students. You deserve all of it. Apply for everything, take up everything. Um, and also rest is power. Um, and I'm so serious about that. Rest is resistance. Make time to rest. Your body uh, will thank you down the line for it. Um, don't don't, you know, exhaust yourself trying to get through these programs. Yeah, I kind of have two as well. Um, I'd say Michigan's a really big school and it's super easy to feel replaceable and for that imposter syndrome to kick in. And while it is tempting to then go after every opportunity you find, whether it's a fellowship or a research project, just because of like that work culture here, it's really important, as um, Zoe was saying, to guard your time and your energy. Um, so really being discerning about what opportunities you're choosing to take on, how it aligns like with your values and your time. Um, and specifically as students of color, there's gonna be a lot of people on campus that want you to sit on like DEI related councils or do DEI work. So be extra guarded about that, um, like those types of opportunities that you're taking in and what parts of yourself that they're gonna want from you because school just like alone is just so emotionally draining. So even if the ask seems small, just like be cautious of that. Yeah, I think just to come full circle is that there can sometimes be a lacking mentality, especially at a PWI as a person of color. Um, but, you know, I think actually seeing about the kind of effect that we have as individuals on our respective communities, I think that that is really beautiful to see. We are here, we're here to stay. No one is here to push us around because we have each other. And so just, you know, keep that strength up and also just find joy in something, um, whether it's going to the gym, taking a ceramics class. I took singing lessons. So just do something that will push you in a comfort zone um, that is not related to the university because your life is not dictated and should not be dictated and is not measured by you're, you know, by the institution, right? Just here, be here to be your fabulous self. Thanks, y'all. And I would add, don't try to do everything. Um, be there, learning to prioritize um, will be your, I think, greatest strength. It is a marathon, not a sprint. And you take you with you as you go through this. So you have to prioritize you over everything. Your coursework is not going to carry you through. Your um, 
that that saying yes to everything that's not going to carry you through your physical, spiritual, psychological, emotional health is what will get you through this program. And also a conditional pass is still a pass. Um, okay, and with that said, that is all the time that we have for today. I wanna thank everyone in the audience for their presence and their participation. And I wanna thank our wonderful panelists for giving both their time and their expertise to us today. Um, the recording of this event will be sent to you once it has been processed. And remember, um, when you get the opportunity for a short break, pop over to the evaluation survey so we can keep improving our programming for you. Thank you and take care of yourselves. <laughs>